In this episode, uh, we had the pleasure of speaking with Amy Bilek, an instructional coach from the Chicago area. In our chat, Amy discusses her current mathematics uh, leader, Pebble, uh, related to creating measurable professional development goals uh, in mathematics that can truly shift teacher practice and in turn increase student achievement. One of the speed bumps that educators face in implementing the professional learning that they've engaged with is finding the time to do it well. Stick with us as we share some practical strategies to address this common issue and much more. If you're a mathematics leader looking to find ways to deepen the implementation of the professional development practices you've been focusing on, tune in to hear what was shared and learn through this conversation with Amy. This is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we chat with math moment makers just like you and work through some problems of practice so together we can brainstorm some ways to overcome them. Let's do it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We're from MakeMathMoments.com. This is the only podcast that coaches you through a six-step plan to grow your mathematics program whether at the classroom level or at the district level. And we do that by helping you cultivate and foster your mathematics program like a strong, healthy, and balanced tree. If you master the six parts of an effective mathematics program, the impact of your math program will grow and reach far and wide. Every week, uh, you're going to get the insight you need to stop feeling overwhelmed, gain back the confidence, and get back to enjoying the planning and facilitating of your math program for the students or educators you serve. Let's dig in, my friends. Hello. How oh my are goodness, you? how lucky am I? I get both of you. Hey, two for yeah, one. Well, two for yeah. Friday afternoon. It's like uh, you know, we're like we get to hang out with awesome educators like you. So uh yeah, we're uh we're super uh super excited to chat with you today. We're gonna have to ask you a question about what is your mentoring moment in you know, like <laughs> hey. Every question we ask every guest on the podcast is what is your, you know, what is your mentoring or what is your, your math moment? What is that moment that when we say math class, it sticks in your, your mind? Would you mind answering that? Well, it's funny because I feel put on the spot right now, but every <laughs> podcast, I mean, I've listened to like all 300 and every time I think of one. And so I'm like, why don't I have 20 at the ready? Okay. Um, I would say mine is a positive math moment. Mm, I like um, it eighth grade, I had a really, well, through my, my elementary and middle school years, I had a wonderful math teacher that was just often giving us open-ended tasks, often letting us explore how to solve them. Um, and I remember I just somehow figured out some problem that had to do with a triangle. I don't remember more than that, but I just remember I kind of figured it out. I had this aha moment and I went and explained it to the rest of the class and she just said at the end wow you should teach math and <laughs> there you are there you are that's <laughs> awesome that yeah. is fantastic it's so great i would say like the ratio is definitely heavily lopsided to the negative memory so so uh tell us a little bit more about yourself we know you're an instructional coach we know you're an amazing math moment maker uh we've been in touch over you know the last i guess couple of years through mm -hmm. that, through email, uh, you know, paint us a picture. What's going on in your world? Yes. Um, so I'm at a kindergarten through eighth school and kind of work with, with all those teachers across the gamut. Um, and I would say, you know, all our, our teachers, um, I would like, I feel like one of our strengths is that we're rooted in like a math philosophy that we help to craft together. And that does mimic kind of the practices that, that you guys talk about as well. Um, and so I feel really lucky to be in this role and to just really help support teachers bring, bring this to life. Cause this is just surely not the way most people learned math growing up, um, from, from their experiences. Um, so that's, that's all been going well. I think this is, well, there was COVID. Um, so this is like the fourth year in my role, but I feel like kind of the first real year where we've mm -hmm. been operating with less restrictions and things like that. Um, so I am just, you know, here for feedback or to pick your brains of how to kind of continue to support, support teachers with, with the goals that, you know, we all share. Got it. Oh, thanks for, uh, thanks for filling us in there. Um, 
what would you say then is uh, your biggest pebble? You know, when you're think about the teachers you're working with um, and the work that you want to do. So envision envision what what work you are hoping to achieve over the next little bit. Uh, maybe going into next year and thinking about the end of this year. If you think about that, what what is our what are the pebbles that you're experiencing currently that uh, that we could try to like uncover here? Um, so I think the biggest one um, that that I know you guys hear about often is um you know and I'm kind of framing it as far as like what teachers come to me with um, to help you know help try to help them problem solve um, is just the issue of you're going to guess it time. And Uh just like the feeling like we are thinking about our middle. So for, you know, maybe we should focus a little bit on middle school, if that's okay. Um, our sixth, seventh and eighth, um, there's three teachers, one for each, and they're an awesome team. They're all math moment members. Um, we're thinking about moving to an accelerated curriculum. Um, our school generally has more of an enrichment model, which is important, um, but just kind of the illustrative math um, accelerated program. And so I just worry a little bit with them feeling like they have more topics and lessons to to cover, um, you know, how I can still help them kind of keep the practices and keep the problem solving. Um, they We've all done a two-year book club with um, Peter Lillenhall's book. So they know all, um, that work um, and really work to bring that out. Um, but I think that sometimes they're trying to do that on top of, um, more traditional practices. So Mm -hmm. when you're trying to do note-taking, do you really have time for a note to your, um, forgetful self? Right. And so it's like, how do we kind of let go of some things, um, to make space for some of these other things that might feel a little more vulnerable right now, but I think are worth it. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because when you bring up time, that immediately where my mind goes is that time is one of those things. And yes, time is finite. There is, you know, never enough of it in any part of our life. But the part that where my head immediately goes to and you sort of hit on it in this last little portion is that is it because you're trying to and I say your educators are trying to layer on more or are we actually trying to trans, you know, transform what we're doing? And, and really what I think you've kind of articulated, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it, it sounds like teachers are trying to do these other things that they think are helpful, but on top of the things that they've already been doing. And that's where we sort of run into this challenge, because I have a funny feeling that before they tried to layer in thinking classrooms or other types of problem solving models, they probably didn't have a big block of time where they were just, you know, sitting around. Right. So, I mean, they're trying to like squeeze this in. And then I guess my one. Hugh Carey, please report to room 212. Hugh Carey. That's trouble. not you. So you're okay. <laughs> not Thank goodness. Possible. But, um, but I guess my question to you would be, do you, if you had to kind of look at the whole school, maybe even beyond six, seven, and eight, and look at the whole school and say, with all the uh, awesome things that educators are trying to do, sounds like they're doing really well and doing a lot of great things. Would you say that they their, their effectiveness or their results, their outcomes are actually potentially being hindered because we're actually trying to do too much and of almost like conflicting things, if that makes sense, right? So you use the example of note versus note to your forgetful self. Well, if I've already done a note, I don't need to do one of those ones over here, right? So right. tell me a little bit more about that in terms of how they're implementing. Um, I would say as a school holistically, um, I think sometimes, like you said, like we're working against ourselves by trying to do do both um, to kind of your example, um, as well as not always feeling the maybe confidence or freedom as an instructor to be really responsive to your students. And one piece was knowing the content knowledge to know like, I don't need to teach every lesson in the unit. These are the big ideas and this is how they can come out in one or two really strategic problems right and um so I think kind of that piece as well of not trying to kind of go through and get every 
thing that might be found in a good lesson done, but being being really responsive to their students. Um, and I think there's moments of success. And as a coach, I'm just trying to kind of think through maybe how to give them the experience of like, oh, look, we did this unit this way. You know, we cut out these things. So we we had time for this and it was successful or with the schools you've worked at, if like there were some ways to help help teachers have those aha moments. I guess my wonder might be, so it sounds like there's like a lot of good things going on. Can you tell us a little bit more about, so you had, you used an example of like uh, Peter's work and doing like a, a two-year book club. Like when when is the PD sort of happening or like the just the in general professional learning? This can be like structured, but also some of the unstructured stuff. Like was the book club truly that like it's like an after school if you're into it hop on board if you're not no is there any sort of job embedded pd happening in the building and yes. what might that look like and sound like T take us down that path for a little bit here okay and um we have a fair amount of teachers that have been here a while so i'll speak a little bit to a couple of years ago so when we had our curriculum review about five years ago we had a week of PD that was really centered around this work. We've had Sarah Schaefer from uh, Methodology oh, yeah. Mathematics. Um, we work closely with her. So she visit, visits every year. We've had probably seven or eight lesson study cycles, um, none this past year, um, but there's a lot of teachers that have got to experience lesson study. Um, this year's yeah. structure, every year the schedule changes a little. So it's Flex, mm. you know, this year's structure has been um, PLCs by grade band. Um, so for kindergarten through second and third through fifth, um, there's members from each grade level on that team. But because they are self self contained, you know, different um, grade levels might um, not every teacher that teaches math in the whole school would be on that PLC. Some are serving on social studies or reading, but our PLC in sixth, seventh, and eighth, because it's departmentalized. Um, and those, those PLCs meet for about an hour, six times a year. And they have a specific student data goal um, and have been working towards that. Um, and- Now, was that, that a PLC goal or is it like a school-wide goal and then PLC I wanted, goal. okay yeah. so a PLC goal yeah. and then where my head's going I'm sorry for hopping in but I got excited mm -hmm. is I'm wondering about like what about across the school like you had mentioned that philosophically it's you know you feel like the school is in a a good place in general but would you say that that's just a vibe thing or like if I talked if the grade eight teacher talked to the grade two teacher would they be actually saying like in this building we are trying to achieve this this and this or or whatever you know that statement might look like is that sort of clarity happening or is it just sort of like we're all kind of we're in we're heading in the same direction and we're all kind of feeling good about it but the direct like we're might be in different paddle boats if if you know what I mean right right I would say when we did this curriculum review, we really articulated and did a lot of training around the math philosophy. And it has about seven bullet points that I think everybody knows should be in every classroom. So like CPA mm. approach or um, learning through problem solving are like some of those, those bullet points. And I think everyone's on the same page with that. I think what you're making me reflect on is like, maybe though we need to kind of narrow our focus of like, and what are we trying to get better at this year, right? Like we know what we are and what we want to be uh -huh. and we can't work on all those at once, right? And so maybe we could do a yeah. do work with that. And one thing I want to toss in there too, it's like, and that doesn't discount that like John might also be working on this other thing that isn't necessarily what we're all kind of focused in on. Like you're not restricted to only do work in that area, but it's like mm -hmm. here in this building, we're going to commit every effort towards whatever it might be the one two or maybe three things but i would argue it's probably like less would be more in that case so that it's like hey if john's at a plc i know what they're working on if you're mm -hmm. at a plc i know what you're working on i know sort of and then it also I i'm wondering too I, the question i had was rolling back to the lesson study and sarah's work we love sarah um i guess my wonder would be is sort of like so what sort of shifts 
is that having, or is it sort of the same idea? It's like, we know it's the right work. It's good work, but we're not really sure if it's actually like heading, like if we're getting closer, you know, it's like, we know it's good. Right. We know it was great in the moment, well, but did it actually help us change something that we can actually well, say it was like this here and now right. it's like that. And we know that because we measured it. Right. Like as, as there been, uh, in any initiative or, or, and maybe, you know, there, there is for sure, sh- for sure is, can you tell us about some initiatives, um, that have taken place where you set like the baseline and go, this is where we are. And then we did this, we put this in place, like Sarah came in to in service of this kind of objective, um, or, or, you know, we, we worked on building thinking classrooms for that, you know, to meet that objective. And then we measured again to go, Hey, we we've seen change now when i say measure is 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 thinking more of along the lines of you know successful districts that we've we've partnered with will measure the teacher practice instead of just waiting to see what student outcomes are um on standardized tests is going hey let, let, did we we wanted this to happen um and we put this in place and let's see what happened afterwards did anything change in our classrooms is there any sort of uh, a measurement system that you guys have used to kind of make sure that there was some sort of change I would be super curious what ideas around that you guys have or have seen from other schools. What we've done, I would say, previous to this current year, um, the PLCs, um, I would work with them. We'd make up a, we'd create a goal. And mostly our PLC focus was around um, like instructor practice, right? So we're like, we're going to be, we're going to focus on the one chapter of Peter Lillen Hall, which is the challenge. you know, X, Y coordinate of like kind of thinking about how we can be responsive in, in a lesson um, and really focus there and have all our meetings on that and come back and try, you know, try something, come back and share the next month. Um, and that would focus on teacher practice. And then this year, um, a whole school push was that our PLC goal should be tied to student level data. Um, and so that, for example, like with that data, our middle grade bands um, for three to five was going to use the student data of actually student response to a survey on journaling and kind of their growth as a mathematician, as a journaler, their precision, their modeling in their journal um, and do kind of beginning, middle, end of year survey data. Um, And then our lower band was gonna look at map data and just kind of student growth. And our middle school was looking at Alex data and usage and completion around Alex, a, a self-paced online adaptive program as a practice program. So That's those what, are kind of the examples we have. And I felt torn because sometimes I feel like the PLC time with a goal that's instructor-based is valuable because like teach, you know, like let's try doing this in our instruction. But mm-hmm. then like you said, to measure that as just like end of year map scores or something like that right. feels like there could be so many things that went on. A lot there of it, a little like, 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 disconnected, you right? You could have talked, you, right. You want to try to narrow, narrow the influence uh, of what's, you know, around there. So, you know, probably a best practice is if, if we're going to want to improve teacher practice um, and we put things into place, we're going to want to set a baseline on what we want to measure. And then um, that's like our pre-survey. And then when we put into place the action items to Im- improve that practice, at the end, we'd use the exact same survey to see if there was a change in um, change in that practice instead of, say, relying on this other thing, which has many factors that are out of our control or out of that, uh, that, that could be influencing. We don't know if there's any sort of, you know, uh, cause and effect or, or just be more of a correlation of maybe there's a correlation here, but we can't attribute it to any specific thing because there's too many things that happened in there. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So yeah, that and I, I think John just did a good job kind of coming back to your question around like hearing what we've done with some of the other district partners that we've worked with. And, you know, it really is very individual. Like we were on a call just the other day with one of the the districts we partner with, and they're early in the process. And, you know, they were sort of like, so what do we do to get like 10% gain in student achievement? I'm like, well. I'm like, well, if that's really what you want, then we're going to have to like very like intently focus in on 
the students and then do intervention and like, it, but is that the real work you want? Cause then it's, it works for that group. And then, but teacher practice hasn't changed, or do you want more of a long-term, you know, when you talk about the PLC and focusing on a teacher practice, uh, it, the benefit you get out of that, is that something that that teacher will likely continue to do over their career and will have an influence on more students. So it really does come down to like, what is mm -hmm. the goal or the goals and then what is it that we want to actually do? And what do we want to see change? We just have to make sure, like John said, it's like, we want to make sure that we're making it as clear a path from what it is that we're going to do to what we're going to measure at the end. Like, we want to make sure that that's as clear and straight as possible, rather than it being something that's like way at the end of the line. So for example, you can implement everything in Peter's book by the end of this school year. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see changes in student achievement because you could have implemented all his practices, but not had the content knowledge to actually teach something valuable to the students, which would actually help them better understand the math. So ultimately it's like really trying to be strategic and planning you know, you've got, it sounds like your philo like the philosophy in your building is, is a, a great one or in your school is awesome. And then now it's almost like you have to have sort of like, I would say like you, you've got kind of like almost like in the middle ground, if it makes sense, you mentioned like seven bullet points, like lots of really good things there. You almost need to go a, a step further and go like in service of what, like, what are we really doing those seven things for? But then also coming back and going like, what are we going to focus on this year as a team? knowing that all seven are things that we actually want to strive for. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like, you've got a really good, and I'll be honest, most districts we speak with when we chat with them, they don't really have anything. They just say they want to shift teacher practice and then they list a bunch of things, but then, you know, someone else in the group lists all kinds of other things. So there's like no alignment there. So you're in a really, uh, I would say like in a really great spot to have already a lot of that traction going. And now I think it's more or less about, continuing that work, some of that planning work, and then trying to essentially craft a plan for the shorter term, but then also the longer term to kind of go, okay, here's what we're going to try to do over this period of time. We're not going to set unattainable goals. Uh, maybe this one in the distance might seem like an unattainable goal like this year, but like down the road, that's what we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the weeds and we start to go, okay, so now what do we need to actually do in order to see that thing or those things start to happen. Yes. Where's your uh, Where's your head at right now on like uh, thinking about some of the the you know the action items you're gonna go you know go on and do next? Uh, fill us in on like where your where your mind's going. Um, I think, you know, thinking through, um, kind of structuring our our plc and our pd focus on teacher practice and narrowing that um looking at our philosophy so it's rooted there but being like what are the one or two things we're going to work on and how are we going to measure that um it sounds like a pre-survey post-survey responses from teachers might be a more accurate way to measure that rather than something that might have a lot of influences or, you know, be um, something that we can tie really close to the goal that we're, we're trying to work for. Um, and then, you know, having a commonality across the grade bands, as far as what we're working for, I think will help um, everybody support each other with kind of making the, these changes and improvements. Um, Am I missing anything? Does that sound like we, what really, we talked about? I really like it. One Sounds thought good. I had to maybe, you know, put in your mind to think on, because I, I, there's no answer to what I'm about to say, but it's something that maybe you think about is that, you know, when you are talking about monitoring and then you're asking the educators, it's mm -hmm. good. That's a good monitoring tool to have, but then you might also in your role or maybe in an administrator's role, um, have another tool. It's not evaluative but to get a real sense of like what is actually happening because a lot of times, and this isn't like teachers trying to, you know, beat the system or not to be accurate or to be honest, 
It's that they think they're doing certain things and then maybe in reality, they're not. And, and now that puts you, I mean, that happens all the time. So it's like having another sort of measure can yeah. be helpful and it doesn't necessarily have to be public or known. It might be for yourself and that might be only between you and, and anyone else on the, you know, the leadership team to have these conversations about that. It's like, well, you know, these teachers believe that they are doing X, Y, and Z, but like when I'm observing, I'm actually seeing this, or I'm seeing it less often, right? We, sure. we call it like, sometimes we get a little overly efficacious as educators mm -hmm. because we're trying our best, right? Like everyone's yeah. trying their best. So that could be helpful for you just so that what, what you'll tend to see that. is that if you just base it on educator, um, like their own survey and their own opinion, mm -hmm. um, what you will see is growth every time, like on the yeah. survey, right? So it's good to mm -hmm. have. But what you really want to make sure is like, is it real, right? So how do I how do I make it um, more measurable? Um, yeah, and I guess more. Yeah. Consistent. So you'd be a consistent eye versus one teacher to the next is not going to be consistent in their interpretation. Right. That's a really great point. And then, do you like bring in much student data with this, or like? I think it depends. Like yeah, it yeah. always depends. Is is that something specific that you're looking to address? Like, is it specific enough where you'll see it? If it's about modeling, like if you want more modeling in, in math class and the teachers are modeling, you might want to see our students now using that because what will happen, it's always lagged, right? The teacher can model all year long and the students may not take it, you know, may not, um, like nothing might change about what they do unless it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. And it's, it needs to really be promoted and in, in, in order to build that habit. So I, I think it depends. There's certain things that might make sense to do that. But again, it's just have to make sure that what it is that you're measuring with the students, you want to make sure it, it is something you would anticipate to change when this practice is changing in the classroom. Which means like you're, you're not say necessarily relying on external measurement systems you're designing something that you can you know measure your what your intent what you're intending to change mm -hmm. so like what kyle's saying being being specific is saying like let's now design this this capture tool to kind of measure what what kids are showing us and and then you can get flexible on on what you want to see from students yes that makes sense now because yeah, the tool itself doesn't have to be there's no perfect tool it really right. is like the perfect tool for your wonder, right, <laughs> is the one that you'll design to match it, right? Versus yeah. like, you can't sort of find one that's going to do it because they're, that might be measuring something else. Right, right. That makes sense. Now, something that also kind of goes in line with uh, some of the suggestions Kyle had made about kind of floating uh, between classrooms and using external kind of eyes is um, you had mentioned, uh, and this is related to what you had mentioned about time, and, and I think when teachers often quote that they don't have enough time, um, it's it's usually a case of priority, and then and then then the priority is usually a case of what is, you know, what is what is what they see that as the priority, but also like what external factors make teachers think things are priorities. So where I'm, I guess, getting at is. Is that helping our administrators uh, you know, um, understand what we're achieving here in mathematics? So you've got your seven points, you've got your objectives, you've got your, you know, your action items that you're going to move forward with. Um, you might want to think about how do you help your administrators wrap in, in their minds around that being the goal and helping them be supportive of the teachers in the classroom. And by by the administrators now showing that. And knowing that these are the priorities for math education for us this year, can and and then them communicating that back to the teachers can like lighten up some of the pressure teachers feel about I have to you know I I can't do this new thing because I'm I'm going to go down this path and it, it's a different path than I'm used to and I don't know if I can cover all my standards and I know my principal's going to be on my back if I can't cover all the standards like there's a lot of out external pressures that prevent teachers from shifting practice. And one, just one, if an administrator can say, look, we are focusing on these things that, and these things are our priority for this year, 
um, that can that can lighten some of that pressure for a teacher to kind of shift that practice. And and then everyone's aligned. And because everyone's aligned on the priorities, you know, it's easier for a teacher to say like, okay, well, I'll make time for that because my administrator is saying I should. And, sure. and there's a lot of like alignment here that has to happen to, you know, to make teaching uh, and changing practice a little bit easier. Yes. No, these were so helpful. I was furiously writing some of these notes down over here. Thank you both for these thoughts. Um, really helps kind of form our plan for for next year. I love it. It sounds like, you know, you've got you got a lot of good good things to think on, at least for the interim. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep listening to every podcast. Alex, it sounds like you have such a great um, vibe going on in the building. Everything that you said throughout, you know, throughout this conversation uh, sort of suggests like, you know, it's a building that I think any math educator who wants to do really great work, like a math moment ma maker who would be listening to this, this episode, uh, I feel like they would find a nice place in your in your organization. So good on you and good on the leadership team for that. Absolutely. We have a great group of leaders and teachers here and thank you. We um we are all big fans of you guys. So thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Well, Thanks it was for hanging chat. out with us. Yes. Well, friends, in today's episode, we had an awesome conversation with Amy. As you heard, lots of amazing things going on in that particular school. And uh, I, I just love the idea that it seems like everybody's rowing in the same mm -hmm. direction. And really, I think one of the biggest takeaways that Amy articulated and, and something that we're going to re-articulate here is just this importance of ensuring that even though we might have the same mindset, we might have sort of the same general vision or philosophy for students in our math program, we want to make sure that it is super clear, both at the long-term level, right? We talked about into the future, into the distance, and then also those shorter-term goals. What is it that we are working with as a mathematics community all together? And at the end of these episodes, after we think about the conversation that we had, we always want to highlight your your focus on the uh, the six parts of an effective mathematics program. And what you heard here today in this conversation was we focused on the trunk of the tree. Uh, and the trunk of the tree uh, happens to represent leadership, vision setting, you know, backbone, PD planning, and communication. And we talked with Amy specifically about setting measurable goals for her. Her, her district and her school to work towards and that alignment across all key stakeholders so that everyone knows what they're, you know, you're, you're pushing towards. And without that alignment, then oftentimes districts are and schools are still kind of left going like, mm, maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. And we're not exactly sure. So setting that measurement of, of uh, set, uh, setting the, up that measurement so that we can see what is actually making a difference in our classrooms is so key to strengthen the trunk mm. of your tree. I love it. The piece that, uh, you know, kind of jumps out at me as you're saying that, John, that I also wanted to articulate here at the end was just this idea came out earlier in the discussion about oftentimes when we introduce new practices that we need to help educators see how it fits in a math block and what will it replace. So in some cases, it makes sense for things to be layered on top, but oftentimes what happens is we run out of time or at least we perceive we don't have enough time because you think mm. we, we have to do everything we're currently doing and layer on this new thing. So being very clear with your PD structure, which is the limbs of the tree, being very clear when we deliver professional learning that we're helping teachers to see where does it actually fit and does it layer in, like does it integrate in with a particular practice that's already happening or is this something that actually might take the place of a portion of your program? Keeping in mind, we never want them to have this idea that everything is out the window, right? It's usually everything out or I wanna fit everything in. We need to help educators find that balance in between. So again, really comes back to our goal, our vision of that trunk, strengthen that trunk, but also when we deliver the professional learning, so those limbs, we have to be super clear that educators see where this fits in their practice so that we don't run into that common first barrier, which always, always is this idea of time. We want to encourage you to take action on the items you heard here today to strengthen your 
uh, tree, your classroom tree, your district-wide tree um, in your mathematics program. And um, if you're also looking to chat with us, um, then we would, uh, you know, so that we can kind of dive into what your tree looks like and how to strengthen your tree, um, just like Amy did here, then reach out to us. Um, head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. Uh, makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. Uh, we chat with uh, members of the Math Maker community, just like you, on their problems of practice. And together we brainstorm strategies and next steps on how to overcome them. So head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. Hey, and if you want to strengthen your tree, understand where your tree is flourishing and where you might want to focus your attention next, you can do this, whether you're in the classroom or a leader in your school or in your district or organization by heading over to makemathmoments.com forward slash report. That will get you over to our math classroom screener. And essentially that'll take you down a path to get a better sense of what's working and where you might focus your attention to next. Once again, head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash report. That'll take you straight to the classroom version and guess what? If you're a district leader and you want to get right to where you need to get to, head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash grow, and that will get you to your district or organization specific screener. Show notes and links to resources you heard here today can be found over at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 239. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 239. Friends, we love ratings and reviews, so keep them coming. It really helps more math moment makers just like you find the podcast so that they can push their practice further as well. Well, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And a big high five for you.